All right, everybody, glad to have you back for the week two podcast. Excited to be here after a great week one, which uh, saw some excellent games, and we're going to get into that right now, uh, what we saw from week one. Uh, we're joined here by my partner, Jim Hammond, and we're uh, going to talk to you about what we saw from the Tyrone Bellwood game and a few others uh, from week one. So, Jim, what do you think? Well, first, let's talk about the game we were at. Um, of course, uh, we'd like to thank Tyrone, of course, for letting us carry the game, and I hope an anyone that watched the game enjoyed it. Uh, if they didn't get out on a Friday night, and uh, if you didn't get to see the game, well, you missed you missed a good one. Uh, Bellwood, uh, you know, they came in with that that good game plan uh, in a rivalry game. Tyrone coming off that big season last year, and you know they didn't have the playmakers and set. Well, Bellwood did. Um, you know, we saw some great, great running the ball by Casey Gray. He's only a junior from Bellwood, and he, you know, he just assured himself that he is definitely one of the best players in the area. And of course, the Bellwood quarterback, uh, Seth Worthing, he is uh, definitely a big play threat too. So, you know, Bellwood's going to be a team to be reckoned with. Uh, you know, the game itself, the atmosphere is great, and uh, Dan can mention a little bit about that. Yeah, um, it was ju just a special thing coming in there when we saw the teams warming up. You know. It was. Uh, it definitely solidified itself um, as the mecca of high school football, in my opinion, in our area at Tyrone. Um, yeah, and as to the game, just like you said, Jim. Uh, first of all, the two things that stood out for me was the playmaking ability by Bellwood Annis, but I think that was all due to the uh, consistency with which Bellwood played. Uh, like they, Jim said again, uh, they stuck to their game plan and really didn't delve from that, even in the second half when things got really tight. And you saw in a game like that, uh, of course, uh, the play of the game, which uh, to give you a little breakdown, was a, a fourth down and about seven from the Tyrone 40. Bellwood had the ball, and they, they did a quarterback design run. And Worthing, you know, sp broke a tackle, hurdled a man, and he was off to the races. And, uh, you know, and at that point, the game was tied 15 15. And that, that proved to be the game winner. You know, Bellwood came up with that big play. You know, they continually got the plays on third down. We saw that all night. You know, they weren't afraid to throw the ball, you know, and the, you know, then on the other side of things, you know, it just never seemed like Tyrone got anything going with their, their passing game. You know, you know, Franco was gone and you could tell Wagner in his first start, it wasn't, wasn't the start he was looking for. Uh, you know, Tyrone's best success in the game came late after that touchdown where they, they put Charles Wilson Adams in at running back or at quarter and they lined up the running back, James Oliver, who's also... A great player and definitely a guy mm -hmm. to watch out for another junior and uh you know they they ran the wildcat with those two and they they you know they moved the ball down the field so moving forward for tyrone you know we're going to talk about their game this week a little bit later but for bellwood you know i think they cemented themselves as the single a favorites with the you know the pens manor loss and the, the statement they made you know beating tyrone for only the second time in the past 10 years so you know it was a great game and a, you know it was a first step for us being able to cover a game, and it was a pleasure to cover that game. And I'm, I hope you guys tune in this week as we'll be down at the Point Stadium covering the Forest Hills uh, Bishop McCourt game. But again, it was a great game by both teams, spirit of fair, packed house. It was everything you would want. It was high school football at its purest and best form. And uh, you know, it was definitely a great game. All right, Jim, well, uh, to stay in uh, that area around Altoona, we're going to go to the Northern Bedford-Glendale game. Which, uh, folks, Northern Bedford, one of the, the D5A favorites this year, they met a, a, a stingy Glendale team who was opportunistic the whole night, but it wasn't enough uh, as Northern Bedford won 20-12. to 12. Yeah, I think uh, one, of the, one of the questions that we had last week was answered. How would Blake Over play at quarterback for Northern Bedford? And, of course, he came up with a monster game thrown for over 200 yards. And, you know, he was really the catalyst of that offense. And, of course, uh, the guys we talked about, the guys we knew who were going to be factors were the Pressel brothers, and they came up with some big catches. Uh, of course, you know, it was a tight game, you know, a 20-12 to 12 game. Uh, Glendale, you know, small roster and all, but, you know, they look like they can play in this single-A playoff race down the line in District 6. You know, you Braniff, the running back, you know, he, made, he, he ran the ball well. I think he had close to 130 yards or so. Mm -hmm. And, uh... You know, Twig made the big uh, special teams play, returning the kick, seventy some yards. So, you know, North or Glendale, you know, small team, maybe not the depth of everyone else in the area, but they you know, they have the playmakers and they prove that. You know, and you know, Northern Bedford, that was just a great opening statement for them. Yeah, I agree, um, Jim. A, a guy, I'm not sure if you mentioned there, the Kyler Dill. He uh, one time he had 
uh, a few catches that constituted the entire drive for Northern Bedford. So, you know, really some playmaking, playmaking ability on that side of the ball. Um, I definitely think that you can rank them up there as one of the better teams in um, single A this year and in D5 and D6. Uh, but, you know, we have the whole season ahead of us still, and I know Northern Bedford knows that. So, you know, we'll see where that brings us to here in week two. Absolutely. Northern Bedford, uh, our friends down there, coach with Bleacher Coaches, we promise we're going to get to a game one of these times pretty soon. Uh, appreciate the support you guys do for us, the Bleacher Coaches. Yeah, thanks, guys. All right, Jim, so that brings us back here to uh, to the Johnstown area as we have North Star and Portage. And, you know, that was a great game. We had some preseason coverage on both schools, and it was uh, just really interesting to see how it turned out. Yeah, you know, it all along, you know, I have been in a, here at the D6 Sports Center where we've been, you know, kind of pinning North Star as that team in District 5 and the Westpac. And, you know, we, we were able to go up to uh, Portage on the other side of things. And, you know, they were young and, you know, they have a lot of freshmen, a lot of sophomores, a lot of juniors playing on that offensive line. And, you know, that's such a key part in football. But they were able to gut out a tough, hard-nosed 13-10 to 10 win. You know, it was an emotional game. Uh, I think a player from both teams got ejected. Uh, the North Star quarterback got ejected. We're not really sure. We can't comment further on what it actually happened. But you know, anytime you take a quarterback away from a team like North Star, that kind of it isolates and takes out your best player, Tony Strazer. He was still able to get a rushing touchdown. He caught you know caught five balls, but still you know down the stretch when you need a play, you, it's hard to get the ball to your best player, who's a receiver. On the other side of things. Portage did a very good job of controlling the clock and uh, you know they were leading that whole game and until the very end where they had to come back they had the big I think a uh, big reverse play a big 41 yard reverse to get them down into you know North Star territory and Evan Price the quarterback uh, converted running back uh, he made the big play the rushing touchdown and th the defense was able to seal the deal so it was a big win for Portage and you know, North Star may be a little bit of a letdown. Who knows? But you know, I think they're a team that can get things back on track. And Portage, well, it, it's going to be a team to watch from now on. Because if with a big win like that, now you know they've definitely raised some eyebrows around the area. Yeah, Jim. You know, um, really one of the things that stood out to me when we were covering them in the summer, Portage. I'm talking about was uh, when Coach Gauss was talking about, and he quoted this also in the paper, was how intense that their camp was. And, you know, especially when you have such an inexperienced team such as Portage with they had a, at least five freshmen playing in the in the North Star game, um, you know, that's almost invaluable to have such a camp wherever there's competition the whole time during camp. And just um, really it was a, a, a time where Portage could, could uh, solidify, you know, who was going to step up or not. Granted, you're not going to know that until the game comes, but – you really get a lot out of your team once you have a, a tough camp such as that. And I really have to congratulate Coach Galson um, up there, up, up at Portage. They have such a great program, and that really showed. That was definitely a key aspect in the North Star victory. Yeah, that's Dan, that's something you would call you know, a program win. They didn't have that that big star player to lean on. They just you know they relied on each other, and they came out with that big win. You know, looking ahead for both teams, North Star. You know, with that suspension of their quarterback, Brantley Rice, he will not be able to play the following week. They'll be traveling to uh, Ferndale this week. So, you know, that's usually a winnable game. But, you know, maybe without the quarterback makes things a little interesting. And uh, we'll be talking on Portage's game this week a little bit later in the show. Sounds good, Jim. All right. Well, uh, then we're going to go to what was slated as a game of the week um, around town here. Johnstown versus Penn Cambria. Uh, Penn Cambria showed their stuff to show why they're preseason number one in the LHAC. Uh, really were able to do whatever they wanted against Johnstown, it seemed, and they came out with a 30 to nothing victory in their home opener. Yeah, that was a game that uh, you, know, you and I and, uh, of course, Brad also picked uh, Johnstown to you know keep things close, keep it a competitive game. And it just seemed, you know, Penn Cambria just dominated the game in all facets, offense, defense. And, you know, Johnstown just really struggled to get anything going. Uh, I know the quarterback, Brody Lowboy, didn't have a, an ideal start. So, you know, if Johnstown, which relied so heavily on that passing game the past two years, to have that taken away, now they become a running team. And, you know, they had Terrell Jones. He's just a freshman playing running back. And, uh, you know, having a chance to see him for a little bit, 
he, he looks like he's going to be a good one, but to ask your freshman running back to go into the conference favorites on the road and be the, you know, the star player, it's going to be tough for any kid. And, you know, he handled it pretty well. But, you know, moving forward with Johnstown is, I, I think, a thing, I, you know, looking at the stats, looking at the box score, a guy that we identified that we thought would be a key player is Philip Madison. He only had one touch. Um, I'm not sure if there's an injury involved, but, you know, he's a guy that he's going to have to make some plays. And with this uh, Jones kid at running back, the freshman, you know, he's going to just get better and better as, you know, his career goes on. He's going to be one of those players that we're going to be talking about in a few years. So, you know, Johnstown's going to get better. They're a team that we thought might start slow, but th th things will be clicking by midseason. And uh, you look at Pencambria, they looked like a team ready to make a run. They looked like a district championship caliber team. They had, uh, you know, they rotated a couple quarterbacks in. They had multiple guys running the ball. And, of course, they, they pitched the shutout. And the guys we knew would be making the plays, the Devin Lawheads and Mac Bahies, they made the plays. Uh, the big six foot five, six six receiver, Nate Kagey, came up with some big touchdowns as well. He's such a matchup problem. So, you know, Penn Cambria, they have the running game. Looks like they have the passing game. And we knew they had the defense. So they're going to be tough to stop moving forward. It's really something to see how um, Coach Fetzer up there has turned this program around. And, it's you know, it's not just, uh, you know, you have a couple of playmakers here and there. and But their defense, just to, uh, to highlight um, something that's noticeable, a noticeable change up there is um, such the, the, the experience, but not only the experience, but it's just the togetherness with which they play. Um, that came, that was highlighted at times whenever uh, Penn Cambria turn the ball over on offense and then, you know, Penn Camry to shut the door on defense. And like things like that, just um, the ability to overcome adversity, I think, is such a key factor for any football team. But with a, a Coach Fetzer football team, really that's um, really zoned in on. And I think that's there's a lot of effort put into overcoming the adversity. Yeah, with Coach Fetzer, this might be his best team he's had since he's moved up to Penn Cambria. So, you know, they're definitely – they're on the radar. No one's. They're not sneaking up on anyone this year. They're the favorites, and everyone knows it. You know, looking ahead to next week, Penn Camry will be traveling to Bedford. Definitely a winnable game. Bedford coming off a tough loss, and Johnstown will be hosting Central Cambry, a team that's had their number the past two years. But you know, this I don't know. You hate to call it a, a must-win game early in the season, but Johnstown needs to come out and you know play better, score some points, get get the things rolling on offense. All right, guys. Well, now we're going to head to the Heritage Conference as we have a key week one showdown. It was really a playoff atmosphere up in northern Cambria as they took on Penn's Manor, the defending District 6 single-A champions and state semifinalists. Yeah, and, and northern Cambria came out 28-20, and from what we heard, it was a heck of a game. Yeah, and, um, you look at that game and you look at the, the numbers and the stats, and, you know, Danny Farron's only completed one pass. So, you know, northern Cambria... Yeah, they didn't have to worry about that facet because you know they only Penn, Penn's Manor only threw the ball four times. But you know, Danny being Danny, he did what he did best, and he ran the ball. He had 156 yards, three touchdowns, and that accounted for all of the points for Penn's Manor. So you know, I think I think a thing we realize, and maybe we didn't realize enough, is that you know the loss, some of the losses from that Penn's Manor team are really going to be evident for a while. Mm -hmm. So you know, Danny's going to have to do a little bit more than we thought. And, you know, it, it showed up. But don't take anything away from Northern Cambria because we, we were at Penn's Manor in the, the summer, and Coach Bill Packer, he said, you know, this, this is a game that worries me. Northern Cambria, they had everything back. They, were, they, they didn't have a good year last year, but, you know, they have this group, a good group of seniors and juniors. You know, Jeff Hogan, the quarterback, he came up with a big game, came up with some huge passes. And Northern Cambria, they look like a, a team that's going to compete in District 6 single A, you know, you know, we thought they would be competitive in the Heritage, but, you know, maybe they'll be competing for a Heritage Championship with Ligonier and Penn's Manor. So it was a good game from what we understand, a, you know, big atmosphere, big crowd. And Northern Cambria is definitely going to be a team to watch moving forward. Yeah, Jim, you know, they have the experience. Um, and as we said in our Week 1 podcast, they have a, a huge alumni association behind them. And, you know, I really think that does wonders for a team's psyche to know that. Uh, you know, this town's behind you, this this program is behind you, and um, I'm sure that was definitely evident up there in front of a sold-out crowd. 
Um, you know, looking forward, Jim, um, for Northern Cambria and and, and Penn's Manor, they, it, it's a tough Heritage Conference this year. So what can we expect as far as that's concerned? Well, we've you know, Penn's Manor played in the big games last year. They won 12 games, 13 games. I'm not sure the number, but they, they were in it towards the end. And Danny Ferens is definitely still one of the best players. Nothing has changed. So they're going to get the get ship, the ship righted quickly. Um, yeah, they have Connemaw Valley this week, a non-conference game. You know, Valley, they played Ferndale this week. The game actually wasn't completed due to some lightning. So we'll see see how they come out, like if Penn's Manor has a letdown after a big loss like that, or you know, maybe Connemaw Valley, they have some momentum rolling from last week. So it, 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 it might be a closer game than one would look at. And Northern Cambria is going to head to Homer Center. Homer Center is also coming off a big win. And, uh, you know, Northern Cambria with that emotional win, it's always tough to keep things rolling, but maybe maybe they have things clicking. So, you know, both teams going to have you know, just an interesting game this week. You don't know what to expect after such an emotional game of last week. So it will be fun to see how they will, how they react. All right, Jim, well, here, let's uh, – and, folks, we'll head over to Richland Cambria Heights, which was a, uh, a key opening game for Richland coming off their uh, huge uh, D6 AA appearance in the championship. Uh, so, you know, we were coming into the game and we were thinking, you know, Cambria Heights, they have a home game, um, definitely rolling from a 5-5 five and five record in the 2011 season. You know, a lot of things could have played out in the game, but uh, much to my surprise, at least, and, you know, I'm sure Jim Years also, uh, Richland pretty much took control of the game from the start. Well, you know, it, it, it was kind of a game how I thought it would go in the sense that, you know, both teams would get their offense going, both teams would score points. It seemed like Richland came up and, uh, you know, forced the, enough turnovers, made enough stops on the good Cambria Heights defense, and they scored points like we thought they would. Um, you know, they had 285 yards through the air. They, sh they split that with Matt Schaefer and Nico Pecora. You know, they both played well, and, they're, you know, Coach Bailey's going to use both of them because they both can make plays. And of course, uh, the big the big game was from Kyle Flick, a guy we thought would have have a big season. He had ten catches, two hundred four yards, and three touchdowns. So you know the game was how how I kind of expected. Richland scored their points. Heights kind of struggle on defense, but they still scored their points. You know, Cambria Heights, they're going to be fine. That was that was a mm -hmm. tough game to start with. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Nate Bear had some big touchdowns. Brawley Myers big catches. They'll be fine. And it's early. I, I still think Cambria Heights is going to compete for a playoff spot. And I still think Richland's, you know, I think they're the best team around. So, you know, we'll, we'll see. They do, they get Penn Cambria in the regular season this year. That'll be a monster matchup. So we'll see how things play out. Yeah, Jim, just like you said about Heights coming back, uh, next week they have Westmont uh, here this Saturday at Price Field. So, you know, just like you said, we're go they're going to get their victories. Uh, there are some teams that they can definitely roll over here in the regular season. But uh, just to kind of uh, talk about uh, Cambria Heights some more, uh, the Highlanders, I really feel like, are a team that where a loss in week one can kind of do wonders, where they didn't know how, how it would be after last year's 5-5. Five and five. It's kind of like unknown territory. But when you come in and, you know, it was still a hard-fought game with Richland. So you know that you can you can at least stay on the same field as a team such as the Rams. Um, so I think that's going to just do wonders in itself. And then, um, you know, when you, you also have Central Camry that they have to play. Then there's going to be, like, huge deciding games like uh, Bishop Gilfo, for instance, who had a, a big victory over Bedford this week. So, you know, I think that the Heights is going to find a lot, of, a lot out about their team here in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, Dan, and to build on what you said with Cambria Heights is, you know, they came in this year for the first time in a long time. They had expectations, and, you know, mm -hmm. maybe maybe they didn't know quite how to handle them. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it would have been tough for them to beat Richland, but, you know, th they were expected to, you know, compete for a playoff spot, you know, mm -hmm. compete for, you know, six, seven, eight wins. So it, they're going to they're gonna grow up. They're going to do fine. They're going to be a good team this year. And, of course, Richland's going to be fine as well. Okay, so moving into our next segment of the podcast this week, we're going to be doing our power rankings. Dan and I will rank the top five teams in double A, district five and six, and the top five teams in single A. Um, you know, not forgetting about the triple A teams, that there's only a couple of them in Johnstown, Somerset. So we're, we're going to focus on the area and the, where we have most of the teams. So uh, kicking things off for myself, I'm going to do double A. And uh, coming in at number five for me is Ligonier. They're at 1-0. 
you know, we, we've identified them as a heritage favorite, and maybe with Penn's Manor, they are the Penn's Manor losing, they are the favorite. So we'll see how they uh, move going forward. At four, I have uh, Central Martinsburg. They had a big win down at Chestnut Ridge uh, this past week. So we're going to see how they handle uh, hosting Tyrone this week. That's obviously a big game on both sides. Uh, number three, I have Forest Hills Rangers. You know, they completely you know dominated Westmont, and uh, they're definitely one of the teams that could be playing at Mansion Park towards the end. Number two, I have Penn Cambria. Uh, you know, absolutely handling Johnstown 38 you nothing. Know, with all the talent they have, the senior leadership, they're definitely a team to watch. And of course, the number one team that I've had all year and all summer is uh, Richland, and they didn't do anything to take that away. They're they're had a big win on the road against the Cambria Heights team. It, you know, game that might have been a trap game. Some people thought, you know, Richland handled it well, and, you know, they're 1-0. So those are my double-A rankings. We'll move to Dan's now. All right, Jim. Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to take the place of uh, Ligonier and put Tyrone in there just for the fact that, um, you know, you see Ligonier every year. They get into the playoffs, and then they falter out. I think a team like Tyrone uh, fits the bill there for number five, even with the new coach. Um, yeah, I think they're, they're going to get things turned around, uh, fi find an identity on offense. I think they'll be all right from there. And then from there, we're still going to stay in the Big A Conference with Central Martinsburg again. Um, like Jim said, they're going to have a big matchup here with Tyrone, the number five team. So we'll see what they're made of this week. And then for the top three, all the real experienced coaches. Um, we have Forest Hills at number three, just because I don't know if they have the firepower that my top two have. But then we're going to go to Richland. And I'm saying Richland at number two just because, you know, I, I really uh, not taking anything away from Coach Bailey whatsoever, but uh, Coach Fetzer, it seems like what he's built up at Penn Cambria in such a short time um, is really something to, uh, I guess, commend. And I'll, by commending them, I'll put them at number one in my double-A rankings. So I'll take us to our single-A rankings of uh, the segment here. And uh, – I'm going to lead things off again. Uh, at number five, I have Northern Cambria. They would not have been in my preseason top five, but that big win against Penn's Manor. You know, I like Jeff Hogan at quarterback, uh, you know, Politis at receiver. I think they're going to do some big things in the Heritage. And definitely, I think they're going to secure one of those eight playoff spots in single A. Number four, I also have a startup team as uh, Portage. You know, with a big win against North Star, they have, a, you know, another big game coming up this week. You know, I like the coaching staff with Gauss. I think yeah, they do a good job up there, and this team's going to grow, and you know they they're going to be a good team down the line and in, in the future. Number three, I have uh, Berlin, which I would now say is my District Five favorite. Uh, you know, they had a big win against Conrad Township, absolutely dominating, forty-two to six. Drew Glaufaltney is one of the better running backs in the area. He's definitely a name you guys you guys need to keep an eye on. Uh, number two, I have uh, the Bishop Court Crushers. You know, they beat Bishop Carroll uh, this past week, and they have a huge showdown with Forest Hills at the Point Stadium. Of course, the game will be covering with the D6 Sports Network. And my number one team, the team I got to see firsthand last week, is Bellwood. Uh, you yeah, know, they just have great balance. Uh, Casey Gray is a phenomenal running back, and Seth Worthing is, you know, a very smart quarterback and a big-time playmaker himself. All right, Jim, well, I'm going to start with number five out of the ICC, Northern Bedford. Um, you know, I, I liked their, as you said earlier, uh, uh, about balance. Uh, Northern Bedford definitely displayed that week one over at a tremendous game, over 200 yards passing, uh, multiple TDs. And then from there, we're going to go to D5 uh, with Berlin. Um, you know, we saw them in the offseason at the passing camp. And, uh, you know, we definitely heard that this, the, this week one matchup was dominated by Berlin in every aspect of the game. Uh, especially, and that was definitely an anticipated game with uh, Connemont Township. So from there, we're going to move up to the Heritage Conference, and I'm going to go with Northern Cambria, um, knocking off the District Six Double A or the District Six Single A champion Week One after they lost. You know, the past two, three years, uh, that's definitely something to be commended for. Then from there, we're going to go with McCourt. You know, winning tradition. It's hard to knock them out, even though you know Bellwood knocked them out last year. Um, they, they're up there every single year, so I have no reason to uh, put them down, especially after uh, you know you, some playmakers were, uh, were born with Jordy Spangler and a few other players. And then uh, I'll definitely agree with you there on number one, Bellwood, uh, the playmaking ability there. And there was a certain thing that has been um, a certain word that has become popular amongst the youngsters these days is swagger. 
And that's uh, definitely something that Bellwood showed, uh, especially you know in crunch time. They were definitely knew that they were a team that is to be reckoned with, and a team that doesn't deserve to lose to Tyrone for the you know eighth straight year. So uh, that was definitely a key deciding factor for me at number one. All right, now fans, we're gonna head into what you're here for: week two matchups. We have four matchups from four conferences, and. Uh, Really, really looking uh, looking forward to the, these week two games. Most of them are rivalry games, so we're going to start out with the Tussie Mountain Northern Bedford rivalry out of the ICC. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. To look at this game, it's a you know it's a big rivalry for both sides. Uh, the game is at Tussie Mountain this year, and uh, Northern Bedford they're coming off that big tight win over uh, Glendale, and uh, you know. Uh, Tussie, on the other hand, they're coming off another close win themselves. So it's a 1-0 a matchup, both District 5 single-A teams. Both teams looking to make the playoffs and make a run here. Um, you know, Tussie Mountain, you, they're gonna, their keys to the game is, you know, they run the ball very well. Uh, Tyler Husick's their running back. He had a good game in Week 1. And, uh, you know, their team, they're going to play defense. You know, they're a tough, hard-nosed team. On the other side of things, you know, Northern Bedford, they're also a defensive-minded team. But they, they have a good, balanced offense. We saw last week uh, Blake Over played some good quarterback for the Panthers. And, you know, they were able to get some things going through the air and on the ground. Uh, you know, saw uh, Cagrese and Ebersol running the ball. Then, of course, you have the Pressels uh, catching the ball. So, you know, both sides, you know, it might not be a high-scoring game. It's gonna, I'm going to look for it, you know, being that low low 20s, teens maybe. You know, it, it it's a rivalry game. So, you know, there's not going to be – I don't think it's going to go one way or the other, and uh, it's going to be a tight affair. Well, what do you think about it, Dan? Yeah, Jim, you know, I really liked uh, how Northern Bedford came out. They, they, they were faced with some adversity at the beginning of the game. Um, Glendale scored first in their week one game, and, uh, you know, really over the way that he stepped in, not being a starting quarterback the year before. And, uh, you know, for him to throw for the amount of yardage and to, to lead the teams on sustained drives, I think that was really key. But one thing um, – that's standing out for me in this game is, you know, you have a uh, a rushing attack by Tussie Mountain, but the the Northern Bedford defense that seems to be really really be the gel right now for their team. That that seems to be their identity that they could look towards, um, especially in in a tight game. So I'm gonna look for to start off with our predictions. I'm gonna look look for Northern Bedford to uh, win this one pretty handily. Last year they won 27 to 12. The year before 49 to six. Yeah, this is a rivalry game, but I think, uh, you know, the way that Northern Bedford uh, is playing right now, I think they're definitely going to win this one handedly. And, you know, that might be a good pick. Uh, you know, looking at the numbers and everything, you know, Tussie, they only threw the ball three times last week, so maybe Northern Bedford, you know, Taylor Pressel, the big defensive end, outside linebacker, you know, he's going to key in on Tyler Husick and uh, Darren Sipes running the ball. So, you know, I'm going to go with Northern Bedford also, maybe – We'll say something around like 27, 17, 27, 14, something like that. But, you know, I'm going to take the Panthers. Sounds good. It should be a good rivalry up there this week. Then next we're going to head to the West Pack. Um, this is, could be one of the more intriguing, the most intriguing match, should I say, uh, of this year. Just by the way that uh, both teams won last year, which was even – or last week, which was differently. Berlin, um, they – you know, just dominated Central Cambria and every or uh, Connemar Township, sorry, in every aspect of the game. And then on the flip side of the coin, you have Portage, who you know squeaked out a win over two-time defending 5A champion North Star. Um, but the way that they did that, you know, it was really unexpected, and they some strong leadership by uh, you know Coach Gauss and company. So I'm really looking forward to this. It's at Portage as well, so uh, a lot of storylines and you know. Little things that could, could uh, mean the difference between a win or a loss here for both teams. So, Jim, uh, start us out with your critique. Uh, you know, it's going to be a big atmosphere at the game. Portage has uh, one of the nicer stadiums, if you know, in the Johnstown and the whole District 6 area. So I think there's going to be a big crowd on hand. And, you know, the thing with Portage is can they can they pull off an upset two weeks in a row? Can they, can they you know, step up and have that same intensity for two weeks in a row? It's... You know, a big emotional win, you know, going down to North Star and getting that win. Can they come back and handle their own with uh, Berlin? You know, Portage, the key key for them is Evan Price. He's the quarterback. He's the leader. You know, he's he took the move from running back to quarterback. So, he you know, the offense runs through him. 
you know, they have a lot of young guys looking at him. So he's, he's a big player to watch. Uh, and uh, conversely with Berlin, you know, they have one of the better players in the area, Drew Glofenley, the running back. Um, you know, he had a big week last week. Uh, Berlin handled uh, Conomont Township, a game we thought would be a little bit closer, but it was 42-6. to six. You know, we saw Berlin in the offseason. They have a nice team this year. They have athletes across the board. So, you know, it's going to be an interesting matchup. Uh, you know, I'm going to, you know, pit, lead off the predictions here. I'm going to take Berlin, you know, maybe 20 to 13, something like that. Because I think Portage, they have they have some confidence now. They know what they can do. You know, they, they know who can play. And uh, Berlin on the other side, they have, they have the guys in place. They're potentially now the District 5 favorites or, you know, the local favorites in that regard with the Westpac. So I'm going to take Berlin. Hey, Jim, I like your pick. Uh... You know, for me, the key for Portage, uh, you know, like you said, how how are they going to respond the following week? But you know, you you, you know, right now, Coach Gauss is telling them, uh, you know, especially the freshmen, you got to keep your heads cool. You can't be too high or too low, um, especially coming into another huge game here. Uh, these could be potentially the two best teams in the West Pack for all we know. Um, but I think it's really going to come down to at home. You know, Portage is, is not just up from their from their week one upset over North Star, but Portage is having their, their home opener, you know. And so I think that's really going to be a deciding factor. But I think that, you know, just because Portage is so young, they might let those let those emotions get to them. Uh, maybe there is some kind of like, now nah, we have to win after the, the week one upset. But uh, like you said, uh, Berlin, you know, they're more in place. Uh, they have a staunch defense. Uh, Coach Paul up there in Berlin has done an excellent job over the years coming into a big game such as this. I think they're going to pull it out as well. Um, say like, you know, 28-14 or right around there. So that'll take us into our next message, or our next uh, game. But uh, before we get into that, we'd like to thank our sponsors, of, of course, uh, the Haven Lounge, uh, Interstate Insurance, and uh, Clark's Corner Store. So, uh, you know, thank you. We have to thank them for letting all this to be possible here at the D6 Sports Network. And going into that next matchup we're going to talk about, we're going to move over to the MAC, the Mountain Conference, and we're going to talk about Tyrone and Central. That's a game that has been a rivalry of late. Uh, Central has uh, built up their program a little bit uh, lately. And, you know, Tyrone, you know, had the great year last year, but, you know, we saw them in week one, and they still have some things to figure out. Yeah, they do. Uh Let's start with Tyrone. Uh, just like you said, coming into a game like this, this is another huge rivalry game for Tyrone. Um, this, a team that has, does not have an identity on offense. Um, we saw them move the ball at times. Oliver, great running back. Um, and then Wilson Adams when he came in at quarterback. But what's really going to be key for me in this game is how is Wagner going to respond from uh, you know more or less disappointing opening start for him at quarterback. Uh, you know, he's going up against a central team, which, uh, you know, got a huge uh, uplifting safety in their first game to spark their victory. So, uh, you know, what are, are we going to see the Tyrone that's just going to, you know, try to do the, the, the zone option with their, their two playmakers? Or, you know, what are we going to see in that game, Jim? Well, yeah, I'm going to look for Tyrone to have, a, you know, maybe you know, they're working this week. I'm, I'm thinking maybe a better offensive attack, maybe a more open mind in uh you know, because they, they played that first game, you know, they were in eye formation until about five minutes left in the game. You know, they didn't really you know, vary too much away from that. And, you know, and I think they're going to have a little more, more faith in their quarterback, Wagner. You know, the only way to, you know, develop a quarterback is throw them in those game situations. Let them make some throws. Mm -hmm. You know, we know what they can do. Oliver's a tremendous back. Wilson Adams a great athlete. And, you know, they have the big line, experienced guys back. So I think they're going to put a little more faith in Wagner this week. You know, I think he has the potential to be, you know, a good quarterback. He's only a junior. So the, the, I think the best way to bring him up is, you know, send him in the road in Central and, you know, let him throw maybe 13 passes, 15 mm -hmm. passes. Definitely. On the other side, you know, we saw Central last week. They played down in Chestnut Ridge in a non-conference game, and they exploded for a 51-point you know, outburst. You know, they have some good playmakers. Uh, Cunningham, the quarterback, he was running the ball. He completed about four or five passes. So they have a little you know, a dual threat quarterback with Cunningham. Moore is a good running back. So you know the big key of this game, the game's at Central. You know Tyrone coming off that big emotional loss against their arch rival. Well, here's their second biggest rival right now in Central. Um, 
well, maybe not their second biggest rival. I think Huntington, if you ask a Tyrone fan, is. But, you know, Central, uh, they've been playing well of late, you know, coming off a down year. But they might be the team to beat in the MAC this year. So I'm going to take Tyrone. I, you know, I, I trust that they're going to get things uh, righted this week. You know, I, like I said, I think Wagner's going to have a bigger game. And, of course, if that, you know, that falls through, they can rely on Oliver and Wilson Adams and their playmakers to make the plays. I think it'll be close. I'll say something, you know, about the 20, 24 to 20 range, of, you know, of popular score in that regard. All right, Jim, uh, yeah, I uh, definitely think, you know, Tyrone will come out with uh, some more splendor, so to speak, on offense. You know, Coach Gudhoff, uh, you know, the game, like, game one, you really – especially like against Bellwood, like you don't want to really make mistakes as a coach, you know, and I think that that probably hurt him and hurt the team a little bit in their week one game. I think they're definitely going to come out with Wagner more, um, probably see a couple of like big plays by Wilson Adam. I'm looking for him to, to have a big game. He had a couple of passes thrown to him in the first game. Uh, wasn't able to, to adjust to the ball well enough in the air. But then, uh, on the other hand, though, we have Central, and, you know, they're with their rushing attack, uh, you know, that, that raises some eyebrows. Um, you know, is, are, are we going to see are we gonna see a Central Martinsburg team of 2008 or something? You know, it's, it's definitely interesting to see with uh, their 51-point uh, outburst on offense last week. But, uh, you know, this game's at Central. Uh, Central's a great place to play. I think that they're going to have a, uh, a marginally tough game, but I think that they're going to win, I'm going to say 28-21 Central Martinsburg. That's a good pick, Dan. And uh, you know, now we're going to move into uh, you know our final two games of the night, and we're going to be focusing on the Laurel Highlands Conference. So, you know, we touched on all the other leagues, so now we're going we're gonna to bring it in for the Laurel Highlands. Uh, we have an interesting matchup, you know, maybe one that you wouldn't have thought at the beginning of the year. We have Bishop Guilfoyle traveling to Richland. You know, we didn't know what to expect out of Guilfoyle. We knew they had some young athletes. They were really young, rebuilding last year, and they're still young. They still have a lot of you know juniors playing in key places, some sophomores. And the one sophomore you have to look at is Brandon Chadburn. Uh, you know, he he touched the ball a little bit as a freshman last year. And you know, for Coach Wheeler, uh, he made the change and he uh, took out his starting quarterback uh, Pat Irwin, who was a good player last year, and they moved Chadburn into that situation to be the quarterback because he's such a phenomenal athlete, and I've seen him play basketball. And, you know, the kid can jump, the kid can run. You know, he, he has all the tools to be a great player at Guilfoyle and just a sophomore. So he's going to be in there running the show. You know, they put up a big number on Bedford last week. So, you know, we don't know what to expect out of Guilfoyle just yet, but, you know, one week into the season, we, we see what they can do. Yeah, they definitely put up some numbers. Um, then conversely, you have Richland, who... We all know what they can, what they bring to the table with their offensive attack. Um, you know, I think a key to this game for Richland is not to go out there and blow them out, but it is to go into this game and to just concentrate on improving as a team. Uh, for a team that, you know, so highly touted preseason, that's tough to do every game to go in and think, okay, we got to get better, we got to get better, but... Uh, you know, I think that this is definitely a game for Richland to uh, to do that. Yeah, it, it's a big game. Uh, Richland, you know, we know what they can do on offense. We've seen Kyle Flick catch the ball. We know both quarterbacks can sling it around. You know, a guy I'm looking for in this game to, you know, I'm keeping an eye on is Tanner Solarchuk, the running back. Mm -hmm. He's just a junior. You know, he had, a, I think, about 80 yards last week uh, on some limited carries. He's a good player, and he's going to, I think he's going to have his time to shine at certain points of the season. I think this is a week that, He's going to have a big game. You know, Guilfoyle, they definitely struggled last year, but with that big opening week win, you know, the new quarterback, you know, they have so many sophomores and juniors playing. It, it's a big game. And, you know, for a team like Guilfoyle, there's only eight spots in the single-A playoffs this year. They, they cut that down from 12. So Guilfoyle, they, they, they're going to have the power rankings with uh, playing the double-A schedule, but they still need to get some big wins in there. And, uh, you know, a win against Richland would just go wonders for their season and could, you know, could determine if they're a playoff team. You know, we're going to look for Richland, you know, keep keep their eyes on the prize. They want to be that number one in the scene. They want to mm -hmm. win the Laurel Highlands. So it's a big game, and, you know, both teams have athletes. It's, it's going to be a fun game to watch, and if, if you can get up to Hurlinger Field this week, it's definitely, definitely one that could be a lot better than some people think. And to make my call, I'm going to stick with Richland as I have all year. But, uh, 
you know, I think Guilfoyle can, you know, with Chad Byrne, the running back, or the quarterback, rather, he can give that Richland defense fits because we, we still don't know what the Richland defense has. Mm-hmm. They, you know, they gave up a lot of big plays to uh, Cambria Heights. But, uh, you know, I'm going to say Richland 42-24 was my pick on uh, my blog this week and on the D6 Sports Network. So I'm going to stick with that, but it could be a little bit closer. Yeah, you know, Richland, uh, their defense at times has been has been suspect and – um, you know, Coach Smith up there has really has really improved the defensive unit. But what they're what we have seen time and time again that they're prone to is the big play potential. And you know, with uh, with Chad Burn in, he made some big plays in the Bedford game. Um, you know, their running game was well it was good as well. But uh, I think we're really going to see what Richland's defense is made out of. And uh, but I'm still going to take the Richland. You know, opening night up at Hurlinger Field. It should be exciting. It's it's amazing how that, uh, how really that stadium atmosphere has uh, sort of improved since you know back in the days when we were playing gym. Uh, Herlinger Field was grass field and it had sinkholes. <laughs> you know now they have a they have, it's a really stimulating atmosphere up there, and I think that uh, you know they're going to be on all cylinders, firing on all cylinders in this game. And I'm going to say uh, we'll say 38 to uh, give Guilfoyle 24. All right, folks. Well, that leads us here into our D6 Sports Network game of the week. Uh, definitely an anticipated matchup around the Bishop McCord Forest Hills circles. Uh, this year it's going to be week two, and we will be there live. Um, we have a special guest with you today, uh, Ross Carpenter, who played defensive back and wide receiver for Forest Hills from 2004 to 2006. Ross, uh, say hi. Hey, Dan. Jim, good to be here. Well, good to hear from you, Ross. Uh, you know, as always, uh, this Bishop McCord Forest Hills game is really, uh, really leading up to be a, a, a great showdown. What do you think of the whole rivalry? Oh, that's awesome. Definitely one of the best rivalries in the area. Well, uh, if you think about that, Dan, you played in the game, and it's funny, I was just looking at a uh, completion coach the other day, and I saw what Tim put together. Yeah, and to build on what Ross is saying, a little thing I put together. Since 2001, Bishop McCord and Forest Hills have played 12 times. The series is tied 6-6. Six to six. Bishop McCord in that span has 109 wins. Forest Hills has 106. Bishop McCord has five district championships. Forest Hills has four. So if you're looking for two consistent programs in the area, you know these are the two teams you're looking for out of the Johnstown area. Yeah, Jim, uh, you know, what that comes down to is just one of the most intense rivalries, I would say, in the area. Um, no doubt about it, a mutual respect, but it's definitely, when it's game time, you know, it's that prime time lights uh, type of atmosphere up in Cinnamon or if you're down in the Point Stadium. Ross, you want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, over the phone here about playing in the, in the game. You obviously had some, uh, some great games against McCord. Yeah, top five team, definitely 2006, Bishop McCourt. 2006, yeah, you had him high up there, and we ended up playing them down in uh, Sydney. Uh, we gave up a late touchdown, unfortunately, and uh, thought Lewis Brad Barber, Chris Sidon, the guys came back and beat us, and ended up going on to win the District 6 championship that year. So, definitely played in some classic wins. So, you know, moving in, you know, we're transitioning into the current state of the rivalry. Forest Hills has won the past two years. Um, you know, then you look at this year's matchup, you know, a very interesting game. Bishop McCourt coming off a week one win over Bishop Carroll. And, uh, you know, 
They've they've had some injuries. They're they're missing a couple of their running backs. But you, when you look at Bishop McCourt this year, they have that that good passing game. Zane Tom Kelsey at quarterback, and his favorite targets are Jordan Spangler and Luke DeFrancesco. So McCourt's you know they can definitely open up the ball. You know, run, pass it, but at the same time they can still run it with guys like Nate James and Tyler Rugg. And you look at that big Bishop McCourt defensive line. You know, it's going to be a big, big thing to see if Forrest Hills with Sean Dell can run at him. What do you think about that, Ross? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I haven't seen uh, McCourt play yet, but I've heard that the big defensive line, and uh, actually with your late start against Carroll last week, we got to get to the end of the game where they were discussing about how uh, Spangler. Had about was it, nine catches for a hundred some yards and three TDs. Yeah, that sounds uh, right. Looks like he'll definitely be a spread out wide, and we'll see if our DB can uh, can stay with him and contain him. And uh, I've also heard the Niederheiser. He's had uh, he had the tackles in the game, and Tony Foxy stepping in and had a decent game quarterback. So it'll definitely be a tough matchup. Yeah, a lot of unproven players for Bishop McCourt, the senior class, you know, kind of deferred to last year's senior class, like Christian Leach, Zach Varga, a lot of those guys. You know, and it's this 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 year's team, it's their time to shine. And, you know, they're taking advantage, guys like Gap Barbin, Jordan Spangler, you know, guys that have been around the program, kids that are winners. And, uh, you know, Ross, with your side of things, of uh, Forest Hills, you know, you, you guys are starting over with a lot of new guys. And, uh, you know, how, how's that been working out with the, the, the new guys playing this year? Yeah, that's a you know, and uh, looking at this game, a big matchup at hand is, uh, of course, you mentioned it. You're you know the Forest Hills big big threat is Jared Shope. Then of course you you, were, you also mentioned Jordan Spangler, at Bishop McCourt. They're the star receiver on each end, and they're probably the best defensive back on each end. So you know they could literally be playing against each other the whole game. You know what kind of, what do you see in a matchup like that? Oh, that will be an exciting one to watch all night. You're right, and uh, you know. It's- it's fun to look at how skilled the wide receiver position is in the whole house. I forget who posted on Bleacher Coach, but it's been like some conversation on there. When you got the flick, the spangler, the show, it seems like you got a star out there on pretty much every team. So this will be two of those stars in the whole house going at each other, one on offense, one on defense, and then vice versa. Uh, well, Ross, we heard a couple uh, stories around town. You know, There's been a lot of... Uh, Talk about injuries to both squads. Do you know if Shope is going to be playing this week? Yeah, Shope will be playing this week. He's, uh, he got hurt in the last week of passing, like, so he's been gradually getting better. He will, he will be going this week. All right, sounds good. That's good. You always want to see the best players on the field in a game like this. And, uh, you know, yes, definitely. And, of course, you know, the last – Last time the game was played at the point a couple years ago, Forest Hills had that great team in uh, 2010. You know they won the district championship, I believe. Then you're then a, you know there was a little brief hiatus in there. But I also remember the 2007 game. Forest Hills was a little bit down, and uh, but it was the opening game of the year, and it was almost a packed house down at the Point Stadium. You, you expect that kind of crowd, kind of atmosphere. You know McCourt's not double A, but there, you know the game itself still has that same meaning. Yeah, both the actually McCourt won it 2008 2009. Yeah, 2008 2009. We had a decent team in 2008. Scott Lewis, the tailback, had about 1,800 yards rushing. 
And you guys also had a decent team, like you said, district champion. In 2009, we both won it, so that's unfortunate. Two of the best teams in the area could have matched up those years. Yeah, it's always tough, but you know, we're glad the rivalry's back on. And you know, looking at this game, maybe to make a little prediction or a little, you know, what what to look for in the game. Obviously, we talked about the Spangler and uh, Shope matchup. I think passing on both sides is going to be key. So maybe if we, the three of us, want to go around make our picks and maybe what to look for. Dan, you want to start off with that? Yeah, sounds good. Um, you know, I, I'm uh, really interested to see how both these offensive lines play. Um, heard from both coaches that the lines aren't what they used to be, you know, especially from those years whenever we played Ross. The lines were definitely um, a, definitely a dominating aspect to the team. Um, so I'm really interested to see how the running game starts, uh, or I'm interested to see how the running game goes, and I think that the key to the game is going to be some sustained drives. Um Worry on the street is that McCord has some guys that are injured in the backfield. There's Tyler Rugg now taking carries. Um, so yeah, I'm interested to see with uh, Dell from Forest Hills to see how he does. Uh, I'm going to say he's going to be a, the key to the game for me. And I'm going to say the Rangers are going to win, let's say, 24-17, but it's going to be into the fourth quarter. I think uh, Forest Hills is just going to uh, – put on their typical Ranger fashion and, you know, strap up the pads and kind of just go at uh, McCord. Ross, would you like to make your pick now? All right, Jen, I'm going to give you the Kirk Herbstreit point of view from this game. I'm going to go with uh, surprising in the game. And I'm going to go with the quarterback play. Quarterback play. And uh, one is still. You look at these two young guys, they just have one league of varsity experience, and while they're getting thrown into a big game atmosphere against uh, the heated rival. So it's going to be interesting to see how those two handle their composure and win their teams in this game. That's a good point, Ross, and uh, that'll lead me to, into my pick. And uh, of course, I make my picks weekly on my own blog, and of course, you can catch us on the D6 Sports Network website. And, uh, you know, I, I think a key to the game is definitely. Uh, you know how teams are how McCourt's going to run the ball against Forest Hills. Forest Hills, you know, typically a Don Bailey defense is tough, and McCourt has the, you know not the biggest line, and that's not the biggest concern. Is they don't have their top two running backs. Uh, you know, Tyler Rugg and Nate James are going to have to run the ball, and uh, we're going to see how they how good they really are. And uh, but uh, of course, I, my pick earlier this week, very similar to Dan's, I Forest Hills winning this game 24-20. But again, I can see it going either way, but. I'm going to stick with the Rangers this week, as I did earlier in the week. You know, yeah, you know, definitely can't disagree with that, especially since they have this couple wins in a row lately. So, uh, all right, folks, well, that's all to uh, wrap up our Week 2 podcast. Ross, uh, we want to thank you for coming on with us. Uh, you know, it's always good to hear some insight from the happenings up there in Sidman. No problem, man. <laughs> Sounds good, Ross. Take it easy, buddy. All right, Jim, well, uh, that's going to wrap it up for us, too. Uh, Folks, we'll see you Friday, 7 p.m., uh, Bishop McCourt, Forest Hills rivalry game at uh, Johnstown's beautiful Point Stadium.